All right. Hi, everyone. We are going over lab 11, um, our last lab for this semester. We skipped lab 10 for our um, mid-semester week off check-in, but uh, last week we were going over greenhouse gases, but now we are going to look at different energy sources because uh, depending on whether it's renewable, non-renewable, the amount of CO2 or greenhouse gas that those emit, um, they vary. So uh, say for like renewable energy, we're going to look at um, solar, uh, wind, but another type of renewable would be hydro. Non-renewable would be other sources like fossil fuels or coal. But to compare them, we're going to start by um, looking at metrics. So putting them in the units so we have them, um, so we can put them into the perspective that we want. So um, the energy units uh, that we typically look at is, uh, the first one is one kilowatt hour, which is a thousand watts used for one hour. This is the standard unit of electricity consumption. This is usually the unit you would see if you look at your electricity bill. Say if you uh, went to your own home or if you asked your aunts or uncles for their electricity bill, you can see that this is the unit that um, electricity companies use to bill you with. Um, uh, one British thermal unit, one BTU, is the energy required to heat one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So around one pound of water is 16 ounces, so it's a little bit bigger than um, a plastic water bottle full of water. So um, one BTU is the amount of energy to heat around that much water up. And one standard barrel of oil, BBL, is 40 gallons or 160 liters, and that's equal to 5.8 million BTUs. And one metric ton of standard coal is around 27.8 million BTUs, and that's around 4.8 BBL of, coal, of oil. So now if we're going to look at CO2 emissions. Last week we talked about greenhouse gases, but now we can see that um, depending on your energy type or whatever source of energy that is being produced um, using whichever method, there's different amount of CO2 emitted. So for coal, it's around 1,350.5 million metric tons and natural gas, it's 526.1 metric tons, a million metric tons. So people usually think, oh, natural gas, you don't, doesn't, it has like, it doesn't admit like CO2 at all. It's 0% CO2. That's actually not true. In the pre-production stage, when you're mining for materials to um, like process natural gas, it does take up um, other emission source, other types of energy to um, fuel that process to make the materials to process natural gas and things like that, or to like cool down factories. So. There is energy that goes and uh, goes into the natural gas process and CO2 emitted. It's a little bit less than coal. Um, so it's on a smaller scale, like less than half of the amount of CO2 emitted by coal, but there is still CO2 from natural gas. Um, one good thing to know is that the market is actually shifting for coal where we're not as reliant on coal anymore or on fossil fuels and things like that, because I think um, coal companies know that coal is a finite resource. Um, it Once you're done mining it and there's no more coal, unless you wait a couple of thousand years, you're not, you just, like, your supply is gone. So there is a shift more to, towards renewable energy and it, renewable energy is also getting cheaper because of government subsidies and like the shift to it. So I, can, I think that's one positive thing to think about. And um, I know that uh, one aspect of um, moving or switching to renewable energy is like, well, what about the people that work in um, the coal industry? What about their jobs? Well, for on this chart on the left, it shows the um, jobs created per gigawatt hour of energy generated. So every one gigawatt hour of energy. So for solar, around six and a half jobs is uh, are created. Well, when we look at coal um, per one gigawatt hour of energy, this is a uh, not even one job. So and these jobs are high quality jobs too. So 
on our right, we can see um, the energy salaries where solar has a wide range for the salaries, but people have worked there where it's around maybe 50,000 to a little bit over $100,000 um, a year for um, people who work in this industry. And yeah, uh, there is this bigger shift and we need a lot more people working in renewable energy fields, either in implementing, installing, mining for the materials to make these solar products or like uh, other renewable products or people in like policy making too. So it's a growing field and um, need a lot of people to go into it. So more and more jobs are being created. And now if we look at cost of production for different energy sources, we can see we have our natural gas here where it's around say 60 to uh, maybe $90 um, needed to uh, per megawatt hour. Um, if we look at coal around, it still starts at like the lowest is around, around 60 and the highest would be 120 uh, dollars per megawatt hour. So it's, Coal is more expensive because, um, and we you know that because you have to continuously mine for coal. You have to keep on hiring people to work at these coal sites to um, have to continuously just bring out the same amount of coal product to get this um, the same amount of energy. But we, if we're looking at solar PV or solar panels, it's a lot lower, and that's because when you mine your initial materials to create your solar panels. You don't have to do anything else after that. Once you set up your solar panels, um, they last, they used to last 25 years. Now they last around 35 years and the technology for it's getting better and better. But once you put that initial cost down, you really don't need to do much else, maybe like annual maintenance for it, but um, it's pretty much like, a, you know, you don't really have to do anything else with it. So the cost, a production to get the same amount of energy is a lot lower. And for the for Europe and the United States, it's around the same, around maybe 30 to uh, 60 or $70 per um, megawatt hour. And it's lower for China and even lower for India. And one thing that we can think about with India is that it's nice because in, mm, as they're trying to reach this middle class, like economically, they, are, there's a lot of potential for them to set up good energy efficient standards and to make the shift more towards renewable energy or clean energy. So the around 70% uh, of their infrastructure that they're planning to build or have by 2030 is not, hasn't been built yet. So all this infrastructure that hasn't been built yet, there's just a lot of potential for them to make this switch to clean energy. And of course, this is gonna take a lot of um, coordination from the energy industry and from policymakers, but and very like aggressive solar PV implementing and installing. But I think there's just a lot of um, a lot of potential for the India as it's developing. Yeah. And now if we're looking over time, the global energy capacity by source. Um, you can see that over time, this graph looks at a time range from 2010 to 2024 and beyond, um, a little bit beyond. And our energy uh, in gigawatts is on our Y. You can see that over time for gas, there is a slight increase for gas in our blue line. It, there is an increase over time, but it's pretty steady. It's not too dramatic and it's still predicted to be pretty steadily going up. For um, coal in our top black line here, um, we can see that there is, it's also steadily increasing, but it's also starting to level out and um, the growing uh, a reliance on coal is going to decline eventually and that is again because coal is a finite resource once you mine, you're done mining it you know your coal supply is gone you can't really do anything else unless you wait a couple thousand years for you to have more of a coal supply so we know that that's eventually going to stop um, start to decrease our, our reliance on it. it's going to start to decrease in this darker blue line is hydro and 
it's also our reliance on it is a lot uh, lower compared to gas and coal, but it is pretty like steadily increasing over time. And that's because when you have waterways and you put in dams and water turbines to get your energy, you don't really need to do well anything else like and the growth for that, um, unless you put in more dams and more water turbines. Um, there really isn't much that you can do with hydro. So it does increase, but not super dramatic. And we also do still use nuclear power. And this is in this purple line at the bottom. Um, and actually, um, nuclear was considered the energy of the future. Everyone thought that it was super clean, super efficient, like it produces a lot of energy through nuclear power plants. But um, and it's, this graph starts at 2010, but in 2011, the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster happened where a lot of radioactive waste leaked into the air, the soil, into water, and tens of thousands of people had to evacuate. So um, after that, that scared people around the world and there aren't any more nuclear power plants being built. Uh, but the ones that have been built have been used and are still being used. And that's why we see that there's not an increase in this nuclear line, but it's still producing energy that uh, we still use to today. And in this red line, this is wind and solar. We can see that it there's a dramatic increase for it and it's predicted to go up even more too. Um, and one good, Thing about wind and solar is that they complement each other. So during the day when we have a lot of sun, our solar outputs are high, and but our wind usually during the day is a lot lower. But then when we um, go into like when you move on into the night, there isn't a lot of solar, but wind picks up. So there's like this balance where during the day we have a lot of solar and during the night we have wind, and that's how they can complement each other and. Over time, the technology for um, harnessing these two energy sources have been getting better and better. And it's, uh, we can see that it's making substantial progress and we're, it's predicted that we're going to be more reliant on it in the future. Um, now, uh, I guess we're going to also go over mountaintop removal where um, this is one way that we can uh, mine for coal, where we have our mountains and um, you put a bunch of explosives around the seams of the mountains where you know the coal is and you blow off the tops of it and um, all of the, um, then you just scoop out that coal from the inside of the mountain. Um, one thing about this process is that when you blow up the mountain top and you remove that top, all of the debris and all of these particles, they're going to settle in places that didn't have um, in places that didn't have these debris and particles before. And it changes waterways and um, now places that was getting water isn't getting, like it isn't getting water anymore or vice versa. So like random flood events can start happening because you change the um, water flow of things. And um, also there are by byproducts of coal mining that um, if you don't properly dispose of them, has uh, has like some implications on people who live nearby. But this video goes into more detail on mountaintop removal in the US. Let me know if you guys can. It's environmental right, that's all you can call it. They've just destroyed our way of life completely. Everything that the mountains meant to us has been destroyed. Since this land got disturbed by the coal and timber companies, we don't have hardly anything left. Just southwest of our nation's capital, one of the greatest human rights and environmental tragedies in American history is taking place at this very moment. Mountaintop removal is a form of coal mining that's designed from the start to take the coal miner out of coal mining. The companies use explosives to blow up the tops of the mountains and they dump the rock into the valleys, totally burying the streams. 
What's left behind is a moonscape. When you're blowing up, literally blowing off the top of a mountain in order to get at the coal and the, all of the all of the debris and everything else, the whole top of the mountain goes down in the valley, dams up rivers, affects communities. I mean, it's just, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. It's so deeply wrong that it, we have to do something about it. When they level the mountains, they have to have something to do with uh, everything other than the coal. The leftover debris is put in to the headwaters of the hollow. And it changed the velocity and the volume of water that comes through my property here. And we've always had a small stream run through here. It's named Big Branch Creek. It's always been a little tiny stream though. And it, through the manipulations of the headwaters of the stream, I've been flooded now seven times. In 2001, uh, the bridge washed out and we repaired it and then it washed out again. Uh, so I lost two bridges. Um, and at this point, uh, we have no access. My son called and he said, Dad, he said, if you're getting home, you better come on. He said, it's starting to flood up here. So we got down to the mouth of the hollow and this 15 uh, year old boy met us and he said, you can't get up a holler. He said, it's flooded. In a matter of an hour, this 15 year old boy was drowned. And with him, uh, his neighbor, a 35 year old lady, they stepped across a little ditch going into their yard that normally was six or eight inches deep and they were swept away. We spent the night together, all of us huddled around in this house and it was a night of unbelievable sorrow. This isn't just a regional issue. Because people from all across America use electricity that's at least partly generated by mountaintop removal coal but it's a small amount that could easily come from cleaner sources of energy. Instead of going under the mountain and getting the coal, they just take the mountain off of the coal and they scoop out all that coal in that seam and they go on down to the next seam and push all the overburden over the mountains into the valleys and they get that seam. And as I said, there's eight or nine seams here they got. And each time it's more dirt and rock come down over the valleys. They say it's uh, more economical. They take a handful of men with equipment and accomplish in a matter of months what an underground mine would take years with a lot of men to do. It's providing cheaper energy for our society, a cheaper cost, big profits for coal companies. A few people are getting jobs, but it's a one-shot deal. And those mountains are, and those streams are not going to really recover. And um, it's breaking covenant with God and creation. The streams that go by me here right now are the headwaters of the streams all over the eastern United States. And it, whether uh, people realize it or not, everyone's downstream from this. We, we uh, the planet shares water, you know, and uh, if there's one drop of it polluted, then all of it's polluted. All of this is happening in a region that's a national treasure, home to bluegrass music and the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's also home to more species of plants and animals than almost anywhere else on Earth outside of the tropical rainforest. It's the worst thing that has ever happened to this state. And it's not even being discussed in the political debates. I'm here to mourn the stupidity and the ignorance that says coal is West Virginia. West Virginia is mountains. West Virginia is not coal. The coal fields, uh, as they're called sometimes, of the southern Appalachians, some of the poorer areas in the country, uh, and yet some of the greatest wealth has been extracted 
there's something wrong. To know that me and my children have been sacrificed uh, for the wealth and rich, riches of other people is very frustrating. Uh, but at the same time, I, I have to direct my anger and do something about it so that my children have a possibility of a future. It's a national sacrifice, and, and as I see it, in a sense, a cultural and uh, economic theft, uh, at least a con that they're trying to perpetuate. It has to change, and it, it, it will change on an individual basis. Everybody has to stand up and fight it. Everybody coming together and voicing their concern together, actually a communal effort really is what it is, through Appalachian Voices can uh, make a difference and will make a difference in this fight. But it's definitely going to take a concerted effort. Growing up in East Tennessee, I thought the mountains would be there forever. But in my lifetime, more than 450 mountains have already been destroyed. And if we don't act, hundreds more mountains will be lost forever. To stop this, we have to remove the cloak of secrecy that's allowed it to go on. And that's why we created ilovemountains.org. Thanks to new technologies like Google Earth, the coal companies can no longer hide the massive scale of destruction that they're causing. Together, we can meet America's energy needs and protect our nation's natural and cultural heritage. But it won't happen without you. Please help us spread the word. And thank you. How many years can a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? So we are going to be using Google Earth Pro to look at different mining sites and different energy sites, but all of these flags here show different sites that uh, mountaintop removal has happened. And one thing too, um, we can think about for energy from California. Most all of California uses uh, um, sources of their energy or is powered by PG&E, which is Pacific Gas and Energy. Um, and there, or Pacific Gas and Electricity. So there um, is, uh, we most of it is powered through fossil fuel and coal, but there uh, is a bigger shift towards renewable energy um, in PG&E. So, that's one thing to think about. But coal mining, um, a lot of different effects and changing the ecology of the land and also um, what, where flooding is happening and also the byproducts of where it's disposed. But we will also be going over that a little bit more later. Now, another energy type is um, wind. So I guess the first thing to talk about with wind is that um, there um, is, uh, an old design of wind where of our wind turbines where we had scaffolding and there's this lattice like structure um, where um, there's also like really short blades that moved really fast so because of its design a lot of birds like to roost and hang around on these old designs and because these uh, wind turbines their old blades were short and they moved really fast, they killed a lot of birds. So that um, bird deaths was one of the, um, the, one of the main reasons why people were protesting wind turbines. But now with this new design where we have this pole like structure and blades and fans that are a lot bigger and they move a lot slower, bird deaths have gone down by a lot. And the technology for wind is actually improving where not only do we have um, like, inland, like uh, onshore, and we have both onshore, offshore wind, and there's even floating wind turbines that um, really isn't limited to one area now. Um, but yeah, the technology for wind uh, is constantly improving, and um, government subsidies also really help make it cheaper too for people to install and to just put up. And like solar, once you put up a wind turbine, you don't have to worry about it afterwards, except for maybe some maintenance. But, you know, this uh, wind turbines, you just leave them up and you don't have to continuously mine for it. You just kind of let it do its thing. And then the power generated from that pays for the wind turbine pretty quickly. So it almost pays for itself really fast. And 
Now, if we look at this map of the US, in the purple, blue, and red in the middle are states that have um, higher wind speeds. And this is where wind turbines can really um, get the most energy out of because the wind speeds are the highest here. And yeah. But again, the power with wind power, the problem with wind power is that um, there was like a, a lot of bird deaths because of the old design where um, short blades, a lot of like short, fast moving blades where a lot of birds also like to roost and hang out in that area on wind turbines. And that was um, bird deaths through wind turbines or maybe like one to two million birds annually. But um, that was with the old design and with the new design, the amount of bird deaths have gone down by a lot. Um, but if you compare it to other, other reasons why birds die, like feral cats, where around a little bit over 500 million birds die, um, it's uh, wind turbines isn't one of those main reasons why birds usually die. And even just from windows, birds can, like around 100 million to um, high 900 million birds die just through windows. So um, yeah, from like flying into windows and stuff. So there is a uh, bird deaths have gone down a lot with the new design of wind um, turbines. But another reason why um, people have been like protesting or very against wind power is that uh, they think that um, property, property like prices, like your value of your property is gonna go down. If you have wind turbines, like say offshore and people can see it and they think it's not an aesthetic, like it's an aesthetic issue. But I will just show you a video that addresses that point. So, and it's a little bit dated, but it still goes over um, this case study in Nantucket of like uh, Cape Wind, where this was one of the reasons why they were protesting was because of the aesthetic value. Right. So let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so uh, the, aesthetic, the aesthetic value, or they think um, that was one of the issues uh, that uh, wind power, when they're just starting up, they thought that uh, because it doesn't look aesthetically pleasing, property values might go down. And actually, uh, Cape Wind, um, as an update a couple years later, it didn't go through because the lawsuits won. And afterwards, um, no wind turbines, no power, uh, no wind power was put up uh, in Cape Wind. So that was what happened with wind power. But there is, um, wind power is getting cheaper through government subsidies. And as the technology for it gets better, they produce a lot more energy, bird deaths do go down. So it uh, does, uh, there's just a bigger shift to wind power over time, even despite like these initial like uh, problems. Now, if we move on to solar, this is a map um, of the United States. And in the darker orange um, here, we can see uh, this is where um, the most sun is like, we, we get the, like the most amount of sun or solar. So it's like a little bit of lower California, Arizona, Nevada, these states here. And if we think about, um, well, the amount of solar that you collect within a day, it's a uh, say in California from a solar panel, it's more than we can use within that day. And unless we have a better electric grid to share this electricity to other states or trade it or sell it to other states, um, we really can't um, hold on to the amount of solar generated to use it in the future because the batteries that we have now, they're not at that point where we can hold um, energy for a long time, but the te technology is changing and it is getting better, but we're not at that point yet. 
So during the day, we would get a lot of sun, more energy than we could really use. But if we think about in that other map where in the middle of the US, there are those states that was that would be a great place to put in wind power and wind turbines. So that would be around the middle of the United States. And it could be like a complementing relationship where um, during the day, uh, we could if, you know, provide solar from all of this energy, trade it with other states and have, um, you know, just trade all this excess energy that we can't use within the day. And at night when solar, um, when there's no sun out and there's more wind, the other states with more, that generate more wind power um, during the night could in turn supply the states that have, uh, that need like power at night, but generate solar during the day. So it's like a complementing relationship and there's a lot of potential for this to work out more in the future. There is more um, talks and works in getting uh, the electric grid to be at that point where this trade and like uh, we're selling different energy sources can be possible. But this is uh, one thing to think about, about the layout of the US and how different energy sources can um, you know, supply the other when the other is like lower. So that is basically the end of my PowerPoint. Now, if we go to Canvas, say um, Lab 11 spatial analysis, we have our um, we have our Lab 11 background pre-lab quiz. Um, before class today, you uh, should have downloaded Google Earth Pro. If you haven't, um, please do so now. You can't use the web browser version in Google Earth Pro, but uh, you can't. So you're going to have to download Google Earth Pro and use it as an app on your computer. And then you are also going to need to download this KMZ file for Google Earth. Um, once you download it, make sure you download it somewhere that you can find and then later open in Google Earth Pro. So either in your downloads folder or whichever folder, just uh, download it somewhere and save it somewhere that you can find. Um, so let me, uh, I guess, show you this, um, the final lab assignment as a Word doc is provided here. This is the one and only thing that you have to turn in. You're not turning in a KMC file or anything. You're just turning in your responses to this Word doc. And you can download that by clicking on this black button here and um, upload it at the end here. So if you click into this final, uh, this Word doc, it's going to look like this. So there is this background information on mountaintop removal, some uh, information on how to use Google Earth Pro. If we scroll down on this first page, we have um, the places that mountaintop remining is uh, taking, like where it's taking place the most. And it's uh, a little bit in Eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, and then a little bit of Tennessee. So this is uh, our study site is basically within this for coal mining within this black polygon. We keep on scrolling down. Our first study site that we're looking at for coal mining is Mud River. And the coordinates for that, for that we would type into Google Earth Pro is 38.07 minus, uh, and then uh, negative 81.98. So if we were to open Google Earth Pro, so after you downloaded it, it would look like this gray icon. We would just select and click into it. And once it's done loading, it's gonna start loading. It would look like this. Um, it'll take us to see the continental US. Um, and in the top left, there's this search bar where you can put in the coordinates, either the coordinates of the place that you want to look at or the place name. And um, right underneath that are different places that is saved for you to use, for you to look at. Um, right now, uh, at the bottom here, there are different layers. More layers might be selected on your map. Um, 
I would just say have borders and labels selected, places selected, and terrain. And I would unselect all these other um, layers just because it, um, we don't need these other layers. And the more layers you have selected, the, um, the longer it might load on your end for Google Earth Pro. So now if we go back to the lab 11, um, question one, Mud River, that um, the coordinates for that is 38.07 and 81.98. We would just copy these coordinates. And actually, let me make sure that you know how to open the KMZ file. So once you're in Google Earth Pro, you're going to click on the file, um, tab all the way at the top. And if you click on this open option on this drop down menu, it should give you something like this. So in this new window, you will just select wherever you downloaded your KMZ file, either in your downloads folder, whichever folder that you put it in, you just select it and then click open and it would open that KMZ file in Google Earth Pro. Okay. Sorry, Maggie, can you show one more time how you got there? Um, the, how we open Google Earth Pro? Yeah. No, sorry, how you open the file. Yeah, so at the top of your um, computer, um, there's like that file option. You can just click on that and on the drop down menu, uh, select. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, of course, no problem. Did anybody else have any other questions? How to get to this point? So. Um, after we copied and our coordinates for Mud River, we can just paste that into our search bar in the top left and click search. And then that would zoom us into our first study site. So it's gonna zoom us in really close, but on the right side of our Google Earth, um, our main window, we can zoom in, zoom out using the slider tool. We can drop our little person to go into street view. And we can also move around using these two different compasses. But we are just going to want to zoom out so we can see the whole study site, which is this yellow box. So for Mud River, we have this main, in the yellow polygon, this is our main study site. What we're going to want to do is just to see how um, the, the area in kilometer squared that's affected by coal mining. And we're gonna do that by drawing some polygons. Um, to draw a polygon, we would, right at the top, there's this toolbar at the top. We have, oh, we have our um, add place mark button, but right next to it, we have our add poly polygon button. So we would just select that. And a new window should pop up that right now it's an untitled polygon. And to start our polygon in our main study area, we can just, uh, our cursor is now this um, box, um, this square, we would just start it by clicking and uh, continue to make our polygon by clicking on the next, um, uh, the next part of our just following along this uh, yellow outline for our study site. So I guess one rule of thumb with that would be helpful in this would be to pick a direction and stick with it. So if you were to do, if you wanted to uh, do this counterclockwise, um, select your point counterclockwise, um, just continue to do that counterclockwise, you can do that too. and. Don't be too um, worried if your uh, final area isn't like the same number as your um, as other classmates as their area. The more accurate, the more um, detail or how detailed you or how closely you follow this yellow polygon, the more um, accurate your final area would be, but say if I didn't really put that much effort into that and just say I 
clicked around and wasn't so detailed, then that would just generalize that entire area. To end your polygon, you would just double click and that now you have made your first polygon. So one thing we can do now, um, you are not turning in this KMZ file, you're only turning in the Word doc. So whatever you name your polygon is only for your reference. So I would just name it something that I'll remember. So say polygon one. And right now we are in the description box, but there's also the style, color tab, view, altitude, and measurements. We're gonna click on this very end measurement tab and it's giving us our coordinates or our area in square miles, but in the Word doc, we want to actually record this in kilometers squared. So if we click onto this, um, this button, we're gonna, it's gonna give us this drop down menu and we can change our units to square kilometers. And so for our first polygon, our main polygon, we have um, the area for that is 46.9 square kilometers. And this is an estimate. So um, if it's different from other classmates, that's totally fine. If you wanted to, also if you wanted to adjust these coordinates, say if you wanted to move points around, you can just click and drag and move these different points around. And that's one thing you can do. And then afterwards to save your polygon, you would just click okay and it would show up on your places. So in this places um, window on the side, that's where our first polygon that we made would pop up. Uh, to Right now it's selected, but if we wanted to look at the land underneath it, we can unselect this and our polygon would still be saved, but it would just go away. So if we selected it, it'll pop up. If we unselect it, it'll go away. So for that first question, the approximate uh, area of cleared land within the yellow polygon, we found that together. You can put that number in here for kilometers squared. And three other additional areas that isn't um, within the yellow polygon, you would just get the, you would do the same process of making a polygon and get those areas and add them up together. So three other areas would be say this um, land here, this area here, um, this, on the side and even this corner piece in the top right. So say if we wanted to get this um, land area in the top, again, we would do the same process right next to the, um, uh, right next to this pin tab, we would just click on add polygon to add our, to do another measurement and say we would title this polygon two. And we would just start to click and select this discolored land area on the side here and just double click that very last button, that very last um, point to end our polygon. And now we have this area um, uh, estimated for us. So the measurements for that, again, in our window, we can just click on this measurement tab all the way at the end if it's, uh, it should stay in square kilometers, but if your units is not in square kilometers, you can just click on this button and then change it back to square kilometers um, using this drop down menu. So for this small area at the top, it's 0.92 square kilometers. And you would do that exact same thing to get a polygon of this area here and this area here. So for question one, we would put one of those additional areas as 0.9 um, and as for one of these additional areas that you're gonna add together. And that would, you'll eventually just add these additional areas to get the total area impacted. So now we can, um, we can also zoom in on our, uh, on our map. So if we wanted to take a closer look at the area impacted, even zooming in close now, um, just a little bit, we can see that the mountains or the um, areas surrounding the coal mining sites, they have steeper slopes. And in the coal mining sites, it's relatively flat. The area has been changed by the process of coal mining. 
but we can also get a better look at this by um, going to this um, eye compass at the top and just clicking around to look around where um, and have a more horizontal view. If we just click on this top arrow button, we can even just click and move around and say if we wanted to zoom in a little bit more, we would have a better idea of how much um, or what the land would have looked like before coal mining and then after coal mining, how much it's changed. It's relatively flatter now. So that's one way that you can navigate and look around your study area. And that's how you can answer question one. So now if we go back to our Word doc, our second study site is Blair Mountain. So Blair Mountain, it's this um, very historic coal mining site where uh, Orwa, there's this fight between the coal companies and with the American government. And um, they were just fighting around for this piece of land. And there's that fight is still going on till today. But we are going to look at this site. We can do that by, again, selecting these coordinates. 37.89 and negative uh, 81.84. We can just copy those coordinates. Go back into our Google Earth Pro site and go into our toolbar and we'll just paste those coordinates in here. And afterwards we can just click search and it'll take us to our second study site. It'll zoom us in really close, but we can just zoom out again using this, um, this sliding tool on the side. And the area that we're actually looking at that's been affected is actually, let me zoom out a little bit more. It's actually right here. So this entire site here that's discolored is Blair Mountain. So we can again just put in our, um, uh, let's go back to the word job and just double check this. Right, so right for Blair Mountain. So let me also put this down. We would just make another polygon for this area. So again, right next to the add place mark button, we can click add polygon and let's just rename this to polygon uh, Blair Mountain. And we can just start it by clicking in the study site. And this area that's discolored, that's our, um, that's the area that we want to know for Blair Mountain. Again, just pick a direction, stick with it, and you can double click um, double tap to end your polygon, move points around if you want to. Now, if we go into our measurements tab, we can see it's still in square kilometers, which is exactly what we want. And the area for this is 9.66. So we can click OK, and that will save our Blair Mountain polygon here. But now if we just unselect that and zoom in, there are um, these uh, flag icons where you can click on them to get additional information on this area. Uh, I guess one thing to note is that if you see on the side here, there's this terracing, these lines. So terracing happens when um, for coal mining sites, when you're moving things around and you're doing construction, you make these trails, these paths. So these are super compact. Um, areas uh, super like pressed in um, soil and they make these um, terracing lines over time. And one thing about this is that uh, afterwards, after you do your coal mining site, um, if you don't properly restore your site, these terracing, it's not, um, because the soil is so compact, really plants can't, um, grow here unless you loosen up that soil. And uh, usually in the restoration phase, they only 
spray seeds on just one, one type of seed in this area and then call it a day. But to like uh, properly restore an area, you would need multiple different types of vegetation um, planted back to like improve depth biodiversity and also properly loosen the soil that's been compact all this time. But right, again, in this flag icon, you can click on this to get additional information on um, Blair Mountain. And it's a, it was a very historic site about, um, basically there is um, coal, coal mining that's been happening that has been blasting um, a lot of, and uh, a lot of uh, debris and particles spreading that everywhere along with the noise pollution and the surrounding communities uh, complained and there was this big fight about it. But then um, basically what the coal companies did was to address this was um, instead of stop coal mining, they just bought out the communities in the area and they made all of the citizens just sign a contract to say that they won't move back and that they won't complain about coal again. So the battle today, um, their philosophy is to not impact people. And if there are no people to impact, then that is consistent with our philosophy. So this, um, yeah, that's basically what happened here today, but within this a window you can read more about it and answer that question for Blair Melton. Now if we go back to our lab 11 assignment. That's how you can answer question two. Um, if we scroll down to question three, we have this ilovemountains.org backslash resources backslash website this link and this is the um, website that, or this is the organization that we saw that video from on mountaintop removal. And if we click into here, it's going to tell us the six, prep, six step process of mountaintop removal. And we're going to talk about three of the environmental impacts. So if we just copied this website and went into our, went to Google and then pasted that it'll take us to the I Love Mountains website. So if um, you just type in ilovemountains.org and it doesn't take you to this page, to get to this page, you can also click, uh, hover over learn more, this tab at the top, and what is mountaintop removal, this very first, um, this very first tab this, that you can click on. And it'll take us, it'll take you to this page. So what is mountaintop removal? They go through a bit of background here. They have the US EPA definition of mountaintop removal here. So the process of it, there are six main components. First, you clear the land where you remove all of the vegetation, topsoil, things like that to prep for blasting, which is the second step. So for blasting, you would um, find the seams along the mountains where the coal would be and you would put explosives there and then you would blast off the tops of those mountains and to get to the coal down there. Um, from this, we know that along with noise pollution, hearing all these blasts, there's also these particles and debris that goes into um, different areas or valleys that didn't have a lot of particles, didn't have a lot of debris, and it just changes the way water flows too. Along with um, blasting out coal, they also blast out everything else that is on the mountain. Um, the next step is the digging process where there's all of these drag lines that come in and um, to scoop out all of that coal. And the next step is dumping waste. Usually, um, usually they do it illegally where they dump the byproduct of coal mining. Um, but if they, the proper way to do it that um, the, to dispose of this waste is to have like you dig a hole, you have it lined with concrete. And if you're really good, you line the concrete with plastic and then you put all of your byproduct, all of your toxic sludge, your waste in there, and then you dam it. So then um, hopefully there's no earthquakes and there's no cracks and it would just stay there. But toxic sludge has a liquid consistency. So if 
there are earthquakes if there is um, a crack in this um, in this like pit, then it's going to spill out and um, go into nearby communities, whoever's living next to you and affect like the area that you're in. So that's the part of dumping waste that, um, yeah, that's our one, one part of the process. Then you process the coal to be distributed. And then that also creates coal slurry, which is like another byproduct. And at the end, your reclamation, it's a, a required by federal law to restore the area that um, coal mining has taken place on. But um, usually again, they just spray that one type of seed for one plant, usually an exotic plant, not local to the area. And you know, to really properly restore an area, it takes a lot of money. Um, you know, the soil is super compact now, you have to loosen it up, you have to introduce a variety of different um, vegetation to increase biodiversity. So that's uh, the reclamation step should be, is at the very end, but um, the process of doing that could improve a lot more uh, as they're doing right now versus what they're doing right now. So if we scroll down, um, this map, this background information, this is in your Word doc, where we're again going over the um, study site that we're looking at, so which is Kentucky, a little bit of Tennessee, and West Virginia. If we keep on scrolling down, these are, it goes over the effects of mountaintop removal on families and communities. So in your Word doc, the three effects that we can talk about are these three effects where there is flooding. So there, um, yeah, when you blast off the tops of mountains and there's all these particles that settle in areas that didn't have these particles before, it changes the landscape and it redirects waterways into areas that didn't have water before. So flooding is usually one of those um, effects that you would see after uh, coal mining. Um, there's also blasting where, again, along with the coal that's being blasted out, other things on the mountain is being blasted and usually it can go up um, 300 feet from people's homes and sometimes they operate these sites 24 hours a day. And yeah, uh, other things besides coal can be blasted out like boulders which can fly into roads and homes. And a third effect is sludge dams where again, this is the, um, the toxic sludge from the coal mining process that's being put in a in a pit that is you know one way for them for coal mining companies to uh, deal with this toxic sludge just put it in a pit line it with concrete maybe line it with plastic too but um, these sludge dams are really well known for being leaky so most of the time toxic sludge does you know it's it can like go into your waterways, into the soil, into people's groundwater. So a sludge dam breach in Martin County in 2000 set more than 300 million gallons of toxic coal sludge into tributaries of the Big Sandy, causing what EPA called the biggest environmental disaster ever east of the Mississippi. So sludge dams, another effect that you can talk about for this question. And that's how you can answer question three. Now, if we move on to question four, this is the Glen Alum Mountain. And uh, we can, well, we're going to look at sludge dams a little bit more. And the coordinates for that is 37.62, negative 81.94. We can just copy these coordinates, go back into Google Earth Pro, and then the top, the search bar, we'll just paste them in and we can click search. And it'll take us to our new study site. Again, it's going to zoom us in really, really close, but we can just zoom out using this, um, these tools on the left side. We'll just zoom out so we can see that the sledge them that we're measuring is actually a little bit to the right we can see that there is this terracing we were talking about, but this is the sludge dam here. And this is the dam that's holding up all this toxic sludge and that's uh, holding this place in. Um, 
we, again, we're just going to click and add a polygon, make our polygon to see the area of land affected here. So we'll just click on this add polygon button again at the top on your toolbar. We'll rename it for your own reference. You don't really need to um, turn in this KMC file. We'll just say sludge dam. So we can start a polygon by just clicking on our map area and selecting the area around this dam. I'll just double click at the end for our last point to end our polygon. And if we go to this last tab in our polygon window, it'll give us our area in square kilometers and it's 1.47 square kilometers. All of these um, points that I'm talking about now, you can just fill them in um, if I'm doing it for you guys. You don't, yeah. So if you wanna use this number, you can do that too. Um, it's just the additional um, land areas you would have to find on your own. So it's 1.47 square kilometers. If we go back to your Word doc, that's where you can um, fill that in for question four. That's the number you can put in for question four. Now, if we move on to question five, I'll just read it to you all. We're trying to find the total area disturbed by mountaintop removal. So according to the I Love Mountain organization, there are over 501 mountains that have been impacted by mountaintop removal mining and a total area of more than 4,694 kilometers squared has been disturbed. So this is the total land area that we're looking at. So how does this area compare to the total land area of A, New York City, which has a land area of 831 kilometers squared. And you're going to compare it to the city of San Francisco, which has 122 kilometers squared. So for this question, there's just these two parts, part A and part B. So in other words, how many times larger are these areas compared to these two cities? Show your work, including quantitative results as you answer this question. So you're just going to divide um, the land area of New York by uh, this total land area that's been disturbed by mountaintop removal. And you're going to do the same thing for San Francisco by that same number. So you're just dividing twice. So at the end of this, for question five, you should get two numbers. And that's, that's pretty much it. Did anybody want me to go over any part that I've covered so far? Okay. Um, okay, so now for question six, we are looking at wind and solar farms. So there are three solar farms or three um, farms that are given in question six. You can actually ignore this very last one, Altamont Pass wind farms because um, they're given like two wind farms and one solar farm. So it's a little um, redundant to have two wind farms here, but only one solar farm here. So that's why you can, we can just look at these two instead. So we can just compare one of each. So the first solar farm that we're going to look at is Nevada Solar One. And the coordinates for that is 35.785. Uh, negative 114.9944. I'll just copy. We'll go back into Google Earth Pro. And we'll go in to our search bar. And just paste those coordinates in and click search. It's going to take us to Nevada. So it's gonna zoom us in really close to our solar farms. Again, we can just zoom out. And this is our uh, one part of the solar farm that we're going to look at. So one thing about solar farms is yes, um, it's great that they're renewable. It's great that once you mine the materials for them, you really don't have to continue mining to get 
um, the same energy output as like if you were going to do with coal, which you have to continuously mine to get the same energy output. But um, you can't really do anything else with this land area once you put down solar panels. You can't like raise cattle here. You can't build buildings near like on top of these solar panels. You can't really do a lot or you can't farm or anything with this land area. And yes, um, Nevada Solar One is in the middle of a desert, but it does affect desert ecology too because these solar panels are reflective. So they reflect heat and it's really hot in these areas. So not a lot of things can survive wherever your solar panels are because it's really hot. But that's like a more, the different sides to solar panels. Yes, it's great that they um, are renewable and they give us this uh, cleaner energy, but these are also some like uh, the other side of solar panels too. So if we zoom out a little bit more, we can see that this is our total study site here. Again, you would just make another polygon to get this land area. But if you actually zoom out a little bit more, there's more solar panels. If you scroll up, we have more solar panels up here and more up here. So these are the three um, solar panel farms that you're going to um, make your polygons for and get that area. And that's what you can, um, when you have your polygons, get this land area, that's what you can fill in for Nevada Solar One as the total area taken up by these solar PV. So in your Word doc, that's what you can do here. Now, if we go to Palm Springs, now there are other wind farms. Uh, this is our wind farm that we're going to look at. The coordinates for that is 33.91 and negative 116.62. We're just gonna copy those coordinates, go back into Google Earth Pro and just uh, paste them into our toolbar or search bar at the top and click search. So same process right here. We're just going to look at the total land area affected and make more polygons. So what we see right now, these black lines are actually the shadows of our wind turbines. The actual wind turbines are here, these white dots, because we're looking at it from like an overview style. So these, um, they're evenly spaced out. Um, we can see that there can be other things that um, the land can be used for other things such as cattle or farming or if you wanted to build buildings next to it, things like that. Usually wind farms, um, uh, wind companies, they would just rent out a small portion of land to just put that one single, um, that would, that the wind turbine would take up. So that's, um, you know, they would just find areas of, say, if you're there's your favorite farmer, but you don't use this land area for anything else. Um, a wind turbine company could just um, rent out that single square space to put that one turbine in. And you would still make some money, even if that land say isn't really well suited for farming or cattle or anything like that. But this land can be used for other things too. That's why, um, that's one nice thing about wind farms, I think. So if you zoom out, we can get a, take a look at how um, how much land this takes up for our wind turbines. So you can see that it starts here. They're evenly spaced out in rows. And if you keep on scrolling down, you, you can see that above here, there's more wind turbines in these neat rows. And you would just get like uh, the, uh, you just get to the land area for this. Just this one part. Um, I guess to make it easier for us, instead of getting one polygon for every single uh, wind turbine that we see, we're gonna make one big polygon and just encompass this entire area. But we're keeping in mind that there's a lot of empty space in our big polygon. So it's uh, easier on us to just make one big polygon. But when you look at that total land area, know that 
um, it's big, but a lot of empty space is encompassed in that land area. So again, we can start our polygon by clicking the add polygon tool and say, it's polygon Palm Springs wind turbine. And we can start it here. We'll just click along and say, add this land area. And say if I wanted to just zoom out a little bit more, I can just move this around and encompass the rest of my land area here. So in our window for our polygon window, we can go back under measurements. And right now it gives us 6.77 square kilometers. So that's what you can record for the um, wind turbine um, for our Palm Springs wind farm. Um, the land area is 6.77, but keep in mind, there's a lot of empty space in this land area that we are considering too. So now if we go back into our Word doc, we are ignoring Altamon Pass wind farms here. Um, we found our Solar Nevada one um, land area, our Palm Springs wind farm, the land area for that. And if we keep on scrolling down, this is when we are going to compare the different types of energy sources in the land that they are taking up. So we have coal via mountaintop mining, solar, and wind. So you're going to type in these land areas here, ignoring Altamont Pass, and then just rank them to the degree of ecological impact. So one is being that you think is high impact, that takes up the most space. You can't really do anything else on there. Um, maybe considering like, does it affect the, um, the ecology of the land in that area? And then three being low impact where you can do other things we use in this land area and, um, and just do that. So when you rank them, you're just gonna explain your ranking. Why did you rank them that way? in question eight. So just write three sentences comparing the three energy types. And then um, this is also just an explanation of why you rank them. But that is basically it for um, what you have to turn in for lab 11. Uh, you don't have to turn in the KMZ file for Google Earth Pro, just turn in your responses on this Word doc. Um, this Word doc is due on Friday midnight. I think that um, not to drag it out any longer and I want you guys to focus on your finals. So I know that they're coming up. So uh, this, I think this assignment can be done really within this lab period too. I can stay as long as you guys need to answer any questions and go over any other, um, like any other points that you want me to go over or redo any questions. But did anybody, uh, want me to go over any part of either Google Earth Pro or this uh, Word doc. Can you just reiterate what's the calculation for number four, I think? Sure. Or maybe um, the one, hold on. The one where we're comparing to like San Francisco and New York. Yeah, Um. I think that's, yeah, so number five, um, we're just trying to see, so we know that the total area um, affected by mountaintop removal is 4,694 kilometers squared. We're trying to see how many New York cities can fit within this area and how many San Francisco cities can fit within this area. So you would just divide um, this number, divide it by the land area for New York City for part A, and then you would take again that 4,694 kilometers squared and divide that by 122 kilometers squared to get how many cities of San Francisco can fit here. And it should just- Got be, it. Yeah. Thank you. Of course, no problem. Okay. Um, well, I can stay as long as you all need um, afterwards if you do have any questions so that you can ask them to me and I can um, help you through this lab. 
But um, that is basically it for uh, lab 11. You, uh, again, it's not due until Friday midnight. Um, oh, there is an end of course survey that is out and I think you can find that on Canvas. You can answer it if you, or like do it if you want to. It's completely anonymous. This is my last semester teaching this class, but I do read through your comments to see what I can do to improve. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, if you do that, that'd be, that'd be really nice. Um, I think you all are doing really well in this class. I am not worried about you all at all. Um, so, but if you do have any questions about any assignments or anything like that, just reach out to me and we can talk about it and I can see if I can work with you on that. Um, yeah, uh, besides that, I hope you all have a good rest of your semester. Good luck with finals and thank you for a good semester. Thanks, Thanks Maggie. Maggie. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you.